pray, shall we? Father, when we consider your aseity, your eternal self-existence, we know that we enter now into that dimension of your character that is perhaps more unfathomable to our minds than any other. If ever we need your condescension, if ever we need you to stoop to our level and lisp for our infantile ears, it is here. And yet, Father, when we contemplate these things, we pray that you would take us way beyond an exercise in abstract philosophical speculation and set us in that place where our minds are struck with the sense of awe of your being. Help me, please, in this difficult task. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I go to the text of Scripture, I ask for the board to be brought over because there are two things I want to write on the board. One is a question, and the other is an indicative, declarative statement. Now, I prepared you that this may be difficult to track with me philosophically, and we're going to get into some heavy things here. But let's start with these first two things I'm going to write on the board, and stop me if I'm going too fast. The first is a question. You've heard this question before. Maybe you've heard it already today. How are you? You ever heard that question? Thank you very much. And then there's a declarative statement. If you can't see me on the lower level here because of the blocking of the pulpit, look up on the screen, they'll get it. I am fine. Thank you. Now, am I going too fast? Yes. All right, there are a couple of key elements in these statements that I want us to look at because we take them for granted in our normal conversation, in our daily experience and communication. But I want you to notice this word that's in the question and this word that is in the response. When we ask the question, how are you? We're asking a question that relates to the state of your existence. Or to put it another way, the state of your being. And when we respond, I'm fine, we're making a statement about our condition, about the state of our existence, or the state of our being. Because in both of these statements, what we have in common is the use of the most basic verb in the English language that we call the verb to be. Now, I understand there are some remote languages in the world that do not have specific verbiage to refer to being. But almost all of the languages with which we're familiar, such as the Germanic languages, the Romance languages, the Greek language, and so on, have some form of the verb to be. It's a word that is so common that those of you who have snow in the roof can remember the old television series called You Bet Your Life, hosted by Groucho Marx, where Groucho, you know, would have his guests come out and they would have a little dialogue for a few moments, 
but there was a mystery word that was already discerned in advance. And if the host mentioned the mystery word inadvertently, the duck would fall down from the ceiling with a $100 bill in his mouth. You remember it, Paul, you know. And Groucho would say, say the magic word and win $100. And George Fenneman would come out and pay. See? It was a household day, a common word. Nothing's more common than are, am, were, was, will be, and so on. Is, these are all forms of the verb to be. But behind our language, which may be simple, is this profound concept of being. Or in the Greek, the participial form is, the present participle is the word ousia, which refers to the stuff by which things are constituted, their essence, or what Kant called the ding on sich. Now, in our experience, we tend to use this concept of being sort of in a graduated way, a ladder, step ladder way, where we talk about grades or levels or ranks of being. We talk about the type of being that you might find in a box of rocks. My son-in-law always says to me, well, not always, but sometimes says to me, Pap, he says, you're dumber than a box of rocks. <laughs> That's not a complimentary thing. <laughs> and so I say to the meathead, <laughs> but <clears throat> in any case, stifle vest. <laughs> At the bottom of the rung is the box of rocks, and then we go up the, from the box of rocks to some plants, some trees, and we say that's kind of a little higher order of being from the rocks. And then above the plants and the trees, we go to the animal kingdom, and we talk about the kangaroos and the emus and the duck-billed platypuses and so on, and talk about their existence and their animal being. And then we go up the ladder a little bit higher, and we talk about human beings. Huh? I have a fellow that was one of our original elders at St. Andrews whenever we would have personnel difficulties, you know, he said, you know what we have here? And I said, what's that? He says, we have a bean problem. A bean problem? He said, yeah, human beings. He said, they're the ones. Human beings, sort of like green beans, with a little more higher level of beanness. And above the human beings, we talk about the spirit beings of angels and so on. And then in our vocabulary, we go to the top of the ladder, and we speak then of the supreme being. Now, I've gone over this before in previous Ligonier conferences, but we need to go over this again and again and again until we get it right that this suggests that there is such a thing as being of which all things in reality participate in one way or the other, and that the difference between God and a box of rocks is just a matter of degrees. We see that the difference is found in the qualifier for being in this distinction between human beings and supreme being. But, beloved, the difference between the supreme being and the human being is not the difference in the adjectives. It's not the difference between humanness and supremacy. The difference really is in this word, being. Because if ever there was a misnomer in language, it's to refer to rocks and trees and flowers and monkeys and people and angels 
as being. Because in the strict sense, no one of us is a being. Now, to follow that, I want to go back into the past, do a little refresher course into ancient thought, where the ancient thinkers of philosophy before Socrates and Plato and Aristotle appeared on the scene, these ancient thinkers were probing the deepest questions of the pursuit of truth that human beings could be engaged in. They were searching for what they called the R.K. principle, or the principle of ultimate reality. That transcendent metaphysical truth that would explain all other truth. They were looking for a transcendent unity that would make sense out of all of the diversity of this world. And we remember the impasse that took place between two of the great philosophers prior to Socrates, Parmenides and Heraclitus. Parmenides' works do not survive intact, only so far as there are vignettes of his thinking that are quoted from some of his essays and from some of his poems. And of course, the most famous philosophical insight that comes from the pen of Parmenides is the affirmation, we'll write it up here so you won't ever forget it, what is, is. Now, he wasn't, a, he wasn't the president of Greece. But he was concerned about what the meaning of is, is. <laughs> and he said, whatever is, is. I'll never forget the first time in a college classroom when I was a student, and the philosophy professor there introduced us to Parmenides, and he wrote this same line on the board, whatever is, is. And I, I chuckled, you know, out loud. <laughs> I said, this guy's famous. All he ever did as far as achieving philosophical brilliance was he learned how to stutter. Whatever is, is. Big deal. And yet, I have to say to you, there is no philosophical concept I've ever been exposed to in my life that has driven me more often and more deeply to contemplate than this affirmation by Parmenides which simply means for something to exist. There has to be being. Now, his counterpart, Heraclitus, challenged this and said, nothing is. There is no such thing as pure absolute being, because everything that we observe in the world around us, every dimension of our experience, every object of our knowledge is given to change. <clears throat> For Heraclitus said, everything that we experience is in a state of flux. The only thing constant is change. And his famous metaphor was, you can't step into the same river twice. Why not? Because if there's a river flowing through, and I step my one leg into the river, by the time I move the second leg, the river has moved on. And so the water I plunge my second foot into, it isn't the same water that I plunge my first foot into. Not only that, but at an infinitesimal level, the bed of that river 
has changed if only a few unseen atoms have been rearranged. And not only that, not only can I not step into the same river twice, but the I who is stepping into the same river twice is not the same I that was stepping in it a moment ago. I am not the same as I was when I stood up here a few moments ago and talked to John and Roger. Because if nothing else has changed since then, I'm five or ten minutes older and grayer and tireder <laughs> and a few other things. If anything defines human existence or the existence of anything creaturely, it is change, impermanence. Even that rock under the blowing of the wind and the shining of the sun and the grains of sand that blow across its surface over eons of time begins to erode and manifest change as it returns to the dust. And so, instead of the concept of being, what Heraclitus substituted was the concept of becoming. So we have to distinguish between that which is in a permanent, eternal, non-changing, non-state of flux being must be distinguished from anything that manifests the characteristics or the attributes of becoming. For the ancient Greeks, though they weren't embracing the doctrine of the biblical God, nevertheless they got some aspects of God right. They understood this, that being, if it is real being, must be eternal being, must be unchanging being, and must be the basis for everything else that is. Because without being somewhere, there can be no becoming. Let me say it again. Without being, you can't have any becoming. Because, as Aristotle noted, and we don't worship at the shrine of Aristotle, contrary to some opinion, but what Aristotle understood <coughs> was if something were in a pure state of becoming, if it was only becoming and nothing else, it would be pure potentiality. Something totally becoming would be potentially anything, but actually nothing. Now, what about God? When I was in uh, the sixth grade, I played in a baseball league that went up and included 10th graders. There were four teams in the town, and they had general managers as well as coaches, and they pulled off change, uh, trades from time to time. And I was involved in a multiplayer swap where I was really excited because I was traded from my team to another team for three 10th graders. Now, these three 10th graders, among them, didn't know whether a baseball was blown up or stuffed. But I was impressed that here am I, a sixth grader, getting traded for three 10th graders. And the newspaper in our local town, this is my first time in the paper, announced the trade, and they said the Indians traded for the slick fielding shortstop Sonny Sproul, who lacks a potential bat. How I hated that word. I would hear it from my teachers when my sister was always the smartest kid in the class and three years ahead of me, I'd come along behind her 
and they'd say, you're not living up to your potential. Did you ever hear that? I began to hate the word potentiality. And if I'm pure potential, and that's all, I'm not even worth three 10th graders who can't hit a lick. But this is our state of existence, becoming, not being. And this is what differentiates us from God. Now let me go to my first biblical text briefly, where we first encounter this idea. It's, uh, turn to page one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is the most fundamental assertion of historic Christianity, and it is the single most bombarded target by secular philosophy and by neo-paganism in our day, because every pagan knows that if you can get rid of creation, you're rid of God, and if you're rid of God, you can live however you want. And so everything that divides the Christian from the pagan is at stake in that opening assertion of the Old Testament. Now let's think about this just for a second. In the beginning, now the first thing that's being said here is that the heavens and the earth, the entire universe as we know it, had a beginning. There was a time when the created universe was not. I mentioned before a few years ago at a conference that I heard the, the famous uh, astrophysicist Jastro being interviewed when the Hubble space, spacecraft was sent aloft, and he was on the radio, and he said, 17, 15 to 17 billion years ago, the universe exploded into being. I almost drove my car off the road when I heard that. <laughs> the universe exploded into being. What did it explode out of? Non-being? Let me also add to this, several years ago I had the opportunity to have exchange correspondence with uh, Carl Sagan. And in our correspondence, we were talking about the Big Bang cosmology and about how the, uh, the, the astrophysicists of our day have gone back in time to the last nanosecond before this uh, eternally organized piece of uh, uh, st stable uh, uh, condensation of energy and material before it blew up. He said, that's as far back as we can go and no further. And I said to Dr. Sagan, how can you call yourself a scientist and stop your inquiry into truth at the most important moment in all of history? He said, well, we just don't have to go there. I said, yeah, you do have to go there because you have to account for this singularity, this point of singularity that for all eternity was stable and organized, immutable, in a state of inertia, and then suddenly, inexplicably, on a Tuesday afternoon at four o'clock, it blows sky high. Stop me if I'm lying, but doesn't the law of inertia say that anything that is at rest tends to remain at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. Your theory of the origin of the cosmos screams for a self-existent eternal being. You can't have it without it. The minute you say there's a beginning to the universe, you've got two options. Either the universe came out of nothing all by itself, or the universe was created by something that is self-existent and eternal. 
That's the only, they're the only options, folks. Don't let anybody play games with you on this. I say it, if you want to get a simple grasp of it, let me ask you this simple question. If there was ever a time, 15 billion years ago, 17 billion years ago, 20 billion years ago, 100 billion years ago, if there ever was a time when there was nothing, no being, no becoming, no actuality, no potentiality, just non-being, nothing, yet, das nicht. What would there be now? What could there possibly be now? Absolutely nothing. If you haven't learned anything else in science and philosophy and in theology, you need to learn the absolute principle, ex nihilo nihil fit, out of nothing, nothing comes. This is why Francis Schaeffer during his career said that the modern naturalist has both of his feet planted firmly in thin air. <laughs> because ultimately, once they deny the existence of a self-existent eternal being who has a seity, their only option is some kind of spontaneous generation, which is not science, it's magic. Poof! The world pops into being, or as Jastrow says, explodes into being. I mean, have you ever thought about what a tremendous explosion nothingness can cause? It's like the philosopher or the scientist who won the Nobel Peace Prize taught out, or, or science and physics who taught out in the West Coast, wrote an essay I read several years ago where he said, the day has arrived in modern physics where we can no longer speak of spontaneous generation, things popping into existence out of nothing on their own. He said, now we have to be more circumspect and understand that for something to come into being out of nothing requires an enormous period of time. <laughs> and so the paradigm shift is this. You can't get something out of nothing quickly. <laughs> but if you just have the patience and you wait long enough, gradually, inexorably, this nothing will be able to do something. See, those are the alternatives to the biblical concept. Pure, unvarnished nonsense. I've made you laugh, and that's what you should do, is laugh at this stuff, because it's silly. Without God, there can be no beginning. Without being, there can be no becoming. And if there was a beginning, nothing screams louder than before the beginning. There was not nothing, but there was one who has the power of being in himself. He has, as John mentioned last night, life in himself. And that's the difference between God and the creature, is that God is pure being. There is no becoming in God. God, as we've just heard from Sinclair, doesn't have a learning curve. He's not learning new things every morning. He's not evolving into a higher form of being than he was six months ago, 
or six billion years ago. He is, as the medieval theologian said, <coughs> the uh, ens perfectissimum. And here, for the sake of theology, they risk redundancy because that little Latin term means the most perfect being. Now, what's the difference between a perfect being, a more perfect being, and the most perfect being? What is the difference? <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, think. What is the difference between a perfect being, a more perfect being, and the most perfect being? Nothing. Because if something is perfect in its being, that perfection of being admits to no degrees. Now, it's not like the medieval theologians fell asleep when they talked about the most perfect being. But they were doing two things. They were doing theology, and as, as Sinclair just said, doxology. They were standing back in awe at the contemplation of a being in whom resides all excellencies at the perfect degree. No lack, no weakness, nothing missing in that perfect being that exists in and of himself from all eternity. I mean, if anything drives me to my knees, it's even the momentary contemplation of one who is pure, eternal, self-existent being who needs nothing from my hands, nothing from my bank account, to exist or to be in his absolute perfections at all times. Now also, in terms of this concept, the medieval theologians spoke about an ends necessary. Thomas Aquinas, for example, talked about God as necessary. Don't tell John Robbins that I just quoted uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas, or he'll pour Aquinas' uh, oil all over my head forever. There were a lot of things about which I believe Thomas Aquinas was wrong. This wasn't one of them. Thomas speaks about God and his being as necessary being. Now, the way in which the theologians of that period spoke about the necessary being of God was twofold. It had two particular reference points to it. In the first case, I'm trying to find another text that I'll get to in a minute. It's in here somewhere. It's in the New Testament. There it is. In the first case, what Aquinas and others meant by necessary being is this, that God, as eternal, perfect, self-existent being who needs nothing from us for his continuity of existence, has necessary being in the sense that a self-existent eternal being cannot possibly not be. Any being that is pure being by necessity is eternal, has being in and of himself, derives his being from nothing outside of himself, can never be confused with a creature because the thing that defines us, as I say, is becoming, or as Sinclair was laboring this point about 
middle knowledge. I hope you really tracked with him on this middle knowledge point. My wife sure did. We walked out of here for a minute, and my wife was beside herself. She's beating herself in the chest, and she says, oh, I can't stand this. To think about the omniscience of God, the omniscience of a self-existent eternal being who has nothing new to learn. He knows all the contingencies of a chess match, but he knows nothing contingently. God has never said, maybe it's going to be this, or maybe it's going to be that. I have to wait and see how it all works out. No. He is from everlasting to everlasting, and his self-existent eternal being includes within it the perfection of his knowledge, of his power, of his holiness, and all the rest of his attributes. But me, you notice how I'm doing in this thing. I can't go from here out the door without having a lady on both arms keeping me up so I don't fall flat on my face. You know why? Because I'm fragile. Things changed in the back of my head a year ago. I might fall down at any second. You know why? It's because I'm a human becoming. <laughs> and I'm becoming older and weaker, right? And so on. But God doesn't go through that. There are no contingencies in His being. There's no might have been in who He is. He is from everlasting to everlasting, pure being, perfect being. And then as a necessary being, He never has to stop and tie His shoe. The being of God's shoes are eternally tied, okay? Now, the first reference for this necessary being is this, that God is, if I can be a technical for just a second, if you can't get this, Roger will help you, that God's being is ontologically necessary. That is, a self-existent eternal being who is dependent upon, and deri- dependent upon nothing for his being, derived from nothing upon his being, has no contingency in him, cannot not be. That the very idea of being carries within it conceptually its necessity. Because that which is always what? Is, thank you very much. He, he is by eternal necessity. That can never be said of any creature. There was a time when you were not. There was a time when I was not. There was a time when the universe was not. But there never was a time when God was not. Because God cannot not be. His being is eternally necessary. And so that's one reference in which we speak of the being of God. The second one is this, that God's being is necessary not only in the ontological sense, but His being is necessary in the logical sense. This is why I plead with my contemporaries who have abandoned all attempts to prove the existence of God by arguing from a rational basis. Why give up these unstoppable arguments that the church has deposited in her faith throughout 2,000 years, that not only is God's being ontological necessary, it's logically necessary. That logic demands that you affirm the reality of a self-existent eternal being as I said a moment ago, because without that, nothing could possibly be. People say, can you prove to me the existence of God? And I say, yes. And they say, how? I said, by this pen. It's all it takes. If this pen exists, then God exists. 
unless this pen is God. But if anything exists, something has to have the power of being within itself or nothing could exist. Is that clear? That's all it takes. Again, if there was ever a time that there was nothing, what would there be now? Nothing. What could there be now? Nothing, thank you very much. But if anything exists, something exists that has the power of being within itself. If anything exists, if there's any becoming, somewhere along the way there has to be being, because without being there can be no becoming. And that being that is the ground of all existence, which may have been true for Aristotle, but it's even more true for Christianity, is the Creator God who is from everlasting to everlasting, who has the power of life within Himself and the power of being within Himself. And then when Paul speaks to the philosophers, as we've already heard, at Mars Hill, in chapter 17 of the book of Acts, quickly, that we are told, and when Paul waited for them at Athens, verse 16, his spirit was provoked when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Paul walked into the intellectual center of the ancient Greek culture. And he got off the tour bus and was saying, wow, look at the Parthenon. Oh, think of the insights of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. I'm at the center of the highest level of human achievement of speculative thought. No, instead, his heart was filled with grief because he saw the whole city given to idolatry. Have you ever been to Athens? Have you ever gone to the Acropolis? Have you ever stood on the steps of the Parthenon and looked down at this direction over here? There's a little bald hill there. No ruins, nothing there. But it's haunted. the ghost of the Apostle Paul is on that hill, pointing to the Parthenon, pointing to the Acropolis, speaking to the Agora, saying, I see that in all things you're very religious. You got a temple for this, a temple for that, a temple for this, and in case you missed Vesta or Hestia, you got one for her. And then, just to be on the safe side, to hedge your bets, you got this one over here, the altar to the unknown God. Well, that which you worship in ignorance, I'm going to declare to you in power. And then he goes on to give probably the most intense and unfathomable, profound statement in the whole Bible. That in him we live and move and have our being. Real quick, last week out in Los Angeles, I using an illustration like this. I've done it here in other contexts. I have this uh, thing that doesn't write, and I'm going to make it move. You watch me carefully. In a moment, I'm going to throw it up in the air and try to catch it. You ready? Now, you watch. At no time will my hands ever leave my wrists. Okay? You keep an eye on that. All right? All right? One, two, three. Here we go. See that? It moved. It changed its position. And what caused that change? You've been taught since you were infants that what caused that change was the inherent power in the strength of my right arm coupled with the strength of gravity to bring it back down. These are natural laws that govern everything in the universe. At a secondary level, that's true. But Paul said, I can't move a finger. without the power of God. I can't breathe the breath of life apart from God. I cannot exist 
apart from God, because in him is life, and in him is my life. I'll talk about this tomorrow, but God can't die. If God ever starts, stops living, what happens to your life? It's over, vaporized. If God's power of motion ceases, remember the game we used to play called Statues? Running around the yard and then somebody says, freeze! God leaves, that's the end of motion. That's the end of gravity. And if anything should happen to the being of God, Human becoming becomes potentially everything and actually nothing as we disappear from the face of the earth. I mean, everything that the philosophers of antiquity sought to discern, speculatively, Paul announced to them at Mars Hill, in him we live, we move, we have our being, and in him he lives and moves and has his being. We can't live, we can't move, we can't be apart from him. But before we were, he lived and moved and was because he has the power of being in himself. And that is the transcendent majesty of who he is. You know, we idolize people in the realm of becoming who reach a higher level of potential than others competitively. We look at Michael Jordan and we say, how can this be? We look at Tiger Woods and we say, how can this be? And we're still at the level of becoming. We're still at the level of creatureliness. And we tend to think how great we are until we turn our eyes to heaven, to the one who is from everlasting to everlasting. We owe him whatever participation in being we have. And as creatures, we owe the one who is not a creature the glory of the perfection of his very being.